Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We're here to talk about the Ravens' very dominant week four performance against the Browns on defense. Excited to talk about this. It's a great time in Baltimore sports. We're going to go into that a little bit. And here to discuss it with me is Brandon Croxton. Brandon, how are you doing? Hey, Ken. I'm doing great after a great win like that. Um, you know, it's always nice to get a big, uh, big win, a very controlling, very dominant win, especially against a division foe. Yeah, it's incredible. The, the the week this week, obviously, they're just coming off the Browns win, and we get to enjoy that for the whole week. And I think if I had to say, I would still say the Browns are the biggest competition that the Ravens have for the AFC North at this point. Um, and the Ravens may or may not be good enough to to be one of the top teams in the AFC North with the injuries they've had, but we hope they are. And, and you know, they've got a leg up in terms of divisional record. But I would say the Browns are the best of the other three from what we've seen through three weeks. And to lay a loss on this like them, even when they have their backup quarterback, is very gratifying, particularly in the uh, factory of sadness. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that is a talented roster that they have and a very talented defense. Um, I mean, Garrett, uh, Miles Garrett is an absolute game wrecker, and he, he, I, I thought he played an outstanding game against us, but we were able to make enough plays to combat uh, – you know, just to counter his dominance and, you know, our defense played lights out. Um, I mean, they, they might've had a backup quarterback, but that's still a very good offensive line. If not one of the best in the league, you, they still have a lot of talent and the, the Ravens were just absolutely able to shut them down in every aspect. Right. It's a, you know, it's, they still have Amari Cooper as a wide receiver who certainly is one of the better ones in the league. Uh, they are Ford is not an untalented running back, but he's no Nick Chubb. Uh, their tight end group is pretty good, but and Joku came into this game with a significant burn issue. I don't know if you saw him show up to the game in a mask. Right, it just scary looked mask. scary as yeah. hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was impressed with that. Yeah, <clears throat> he yeah. played through it. He had a visor on, so you couldn't really see what had happened to his face in the in the. I guess he was burned somehow around the house. Uh, mm -hmm. But anyway. Uh, more injuries this week are the bad news. So why don't we get that done with first? Um, Moses, a shoulder injury. They say, you know, whenever I hear shoulder, I hold my breath and I wonder if it's a peck. Yeah, it. Yeah, you you hope hope you you hope for the best with that. Uh, like, and the, possibly maybe his shoulder just popped out and popped back in, like a d d dislocation or something like Ooh. that. Also, which is not good, but is something that can he can work through and hopefully be better in a few in a couple of weeks but yeah have have you ever had an injury like that and you play defensive line but maybe teammates where they had a dislocated shoulder and they end up playing in a harness after that oh yeah i had a dislocated shoulder um and it's not fun i was out for about three weeks um the my shoulder it popped the, the socket popped out to the front of my shoulder and it was mm -hmm. it, it's it's not super painful but it really weakens all of the muscles around your shoulder so it's it it becomes very hard to play and it and the once it once it pops out the first time it can pop out again a lot easier than than any time before so is there usually some break or chip that comes loose for it to happen or it's just it creates space and then that space can be exploited again by the by additional the, impacts the ligaments that keep your shoulder intact get stretched and once okay. they stretch they they don't tighten up back to normal so mm -hmm. when they're when they're looser it, your, your shoulder or or really kind of any joint um becomes a lot easier to you know possibly tear or dislocate again like it, it can happen with your knee ankle things like that as well all right so maybe we don't project on moses that this is the injury i certainly hope it's not um you know i, I would hope it's a stinger you know and that that can be rubbed yeah. out and worked with and they just didn't put him back in the game here but um i don't think we we honestly know at this point Worley also came up with something that looked like a shoulder injury. Again, you know, we don't know exactly. Yeah. 
Uh, I didn't hear anything today from Harbaugh about Daryl Worley. Um, and then JAD had a hamstring injury. Yeah. And it's, you know, the guys keep going down with, with these injuries and it, it, it didn't sound like anybody was a major injury, which I think is a positive thing. I guess, I guess we got bad news about it. Ojabo possibly being yeah. out for the rest of the season, but I think they were saying there's a decision that he has to make on that front. But I mean, I mean these smaller injuries just keep piling up and, they become a pain in the short term, but to, to be positive is, you know, hopefully a lot of these guys will be coming back in the, over the next couple of weeks to a month. Yeah, uh, we, we certainly hope that. And obviously got some big ones that potentially coming back. We did get Linderbaum back in this game. Uh, Keaton Mitchell, uh, Tyus Bowser, Ronnie Stanley, uh, still on the shelf and hopefully we'll come back soon. We don't really have good information on Dafe Owe, I don't feel, currently about when he might be back. Right, exactly. And hopefully Marlon Humphrey will be back uh, in the next couple of weeks, too. Uh, Harbaugh said he hopes to see him out in the practice field this week. And so maybe he could suit up Sunday for, you know, a limited reps or something like that and maybe be full go the following week. That's that would be a very cool timeline. I'm 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 buying one of the Brandon timeline there. Uh <laughs> We, t- we talked a little bit about Ajabo. When he when Harbaugh says he has decisions to make, that means only one thing to me. It means he has to decide whether to have season-ending injury or try and play through it to the end of the year um, right. with some either amount of pain or the potential for the injury to be made worse. Right, exactly. And, yeah, it's pretty unfortunate um, to have that, you know, have a, have a very hard decision with that. I guess, I, you know, he's really got a – decide what's going to be best for him in the long term like because whatever injury it is if it's possible that it could get worse and they lose him anyway for a year or even you know going into 24 that's really going to set him back as far as you know his development and yeah yeah so exactly it's it's very serious and obviously it would probably have been better if Ajabo could have been NFI'd for the entire season last year, it's not typically the deal, although I do understand that's the deal with Voris as far as we know it right now, that he won't be activated at some point to practice later in the year. And the, the Ravens should still have four years with him, but we'll see how it, how it ends up playing out. Uh, Brian McFarland actually is on the other side of that. He thinks that the, the Ravens will not try and take a year of, of um, credited service time away from Voris. And we'll eventually let him get um, activated at some point this year. I don't know that they'll have a room, sure. honestly, on their on their fifty three man roster at this point. So I don't know how they do it. Um, yeah. You know, this game ended up two hours or so before game time. Maybe it was three. We heard the news first reported that Deshaun Watson was not going to play, which completely changes like any good starting quarterback being out, which has an untested rookie backup it significantly changes mm-hmm. what the game plan will be. Right, exactly. And um, you know, the Ravens are usually very tough on rookie quarterbacks, no matter what the pedi- their pedigree is, whether a first-round pick or a later-round pick. And, um, yeah, they, they did not make life easy for DTR uh, yesterday. Yeah, we see now C.J. Stroud, and obviously he's right at the top of the first round. Dorian DTR was a um, sixth round pick, I believe. It might have been a five, but one of the other. Yeah, he was but later. Mm-hmm. C.J. Stroud had a 78 quarterback rating with five sacks in his first game against the Ravens. Since then, he's been the talk of the NFL with a rating well over 100 um, the, rest mm-hmm. of the, the rest of the way. And he has six touchdowns and no interceptions for the season right now. So he's six and zero since then, since that first game against the Ravens, um, it really puts things in perspective with how Houston really handled Pittsburgh, a good defense uh, mm-hmm. this last week. Right. Yeah. I, I think, you know, it's a testament to how well the Ravens defense is playing because I mean, CJ Stroud could not move the ball. I mean, they, it, it, it would have taken him five or six quarters to get his first touchdown against the way our defense was playing. And he's been lighting up everybody since he, I mean, he looks like a, you know, like a real potential franchise quarterback for them. So yeah, it, it's encouraging to see, you know, 
how well we played against them. And yeah, it's, it's exciting to see. Yeah, very much so. Um, in this game against uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson, um, the Ravens only allowed 73 net yards. They had 121 yards of passing offense, lost 48 on four sacks. By the way, that's pretty hard to do. Those are long sacks, but they had a team sack for minus 18 and a, <laughs> another minus 13. But anyway, nice, mm-hmm. nice group of sacks there. That compares to 88 interception return yards that the Ravens have. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's pr- pretty rough right there. You, you basically have a net negative <laughs> on yeah. uh, on yardage on total yardage on on passes. Yeah, yeah. Now I know you look at statistics very much, and you had some other good numbers, which might be great water cooler fodder for people who want to take the information gained from this podcast and, and take it to, uh, to work tomorrow with them. But what, uh, what did you find statistically in terms of anomalies that were exceptional? Yeah. So number one, um, just to show how inept the, the Browns offense was and how well the de- the Ravens defense played. So they, the Ravens had 13 plays of zero or negative yards that were not incompletion. So obviously an incomplete pass is, goes for zero yards. These were either completed passes or runs that were stopped for zero or negative yards in 13. And that is just an absolute huge number. I mean, you considering most teams get between 65, 75 plays in a game and you, yep. you almost 20% go for zero or negative yards. It's, they they that happen is, to have exactly sixty five in this game, by the way. Okay. Uh huh. See, yeah, yeah, right there. So, yeah, to to have that many and you know all these negative plays, they set the, set an offense back so much and gives such a big advantage to the defense because now you're behind this, but you're off schedule, you're behind mm-hmm. the sticks, and you, the defense can just tee off on because they know you you have to pass and you have to get downfield and they can key on that. Yeah. It's uh, that's 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 an incredible number. I'll tell you that. And um, it wasn't a ton of runs for zero, though. They had a couple of them, at least. They had a couple, maybe a pass for zero as well. They had one pass for zero, I think, on my sheet here. Um, but uh, it was it was a lot of negative plays in there, including a run for minus 20, which was about the, among the funniest football plays I've ever seen. Gosh, I, I, I couldn't believe Elijah Moore. It's like just go. I, I'm 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 screaming. I'm just like just go down, just go down. You're just <laughs> and at the same time, I'm like yeah, keep going back. You take it back to midfield. It was absolutely just a boneheaded play, and I'm glad they they were able to get him down finally. After, yeah, yeah. After he lost what twenty three yards on that play. Uh, 20, I think, but he was, he was very elusive on the play to get back to escape trouble. And you thought maybe he'd escaped it the one more time, but there was a little bit of contact while his knee was down, which is just, just great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think there is kind of one overarching theme for how McDonald schemed the defense up against the Browns in this game that I think is really worth visiting because I think there are two ways that you can go about trying to have a big advantage defensively. And I'll I'll say the A way, the better way, the way that a lot of teams have done it over the years, but it usually requires a lot of resource investment is to have a great four man pass rush. So you could do it. You can be the Dallas Cowboys of the 1970s or the, or the um, Rams of the late sixties with their fearsome foursome. Yeah. yeah, The, the purple people eaters and uh, Mm -hmm. uh, any of those, any of those defenses had great front fours that could get after the quarterback with four men and get there often. Right, with with frequency. And we're going to talk a little bit about what the Ravens did in this game as well. I think the B way to um, accomplish a, a, a similar thing is to be able to play nickel pretty much whatever the, your opponent presents you, including 12 personnel, to be able to have defenders who are flexible enough to defend the run and pass. And the real key thing comes down to is – With the nickel, you can usually defend the pass pretty effectively. But what you can't necessarily do is defend the run because you're working with a lighter box of six men, and then you have to get other ancillary contributions from safety and slot corner usually to get those additional tackle um, opportunities. And uh, that's where a lot of teams, it just doesn't work for them. The Ravens, historically, that has been their way. It's the B method, but it has been their way in history is they could always stop the run with six, and they did it by having – 
unbelievable edge setters, great interior players who are always extremely stout, and they always valued that in terms of drafting defensive linemen, and then great off-ball linebackers uh, in the middle who, who would make plays. And, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about Bart Scott or, or uh, Ray Lewis or Mosley or Roquan or Patrick Queen now. Uh, mm-hmm. But they all they all really could uh, get the job done in terms of defending the run. Right, exactly. And it, it really starts up front. And the defensive line, especially the interior line, has really handled and controlled Cleveland a whole lot um, in, in this game. Um, I mean, Cleveland's guards, Petonio's the multi-time All-Pro, and Teller's a really good guard as well. Like, they have a, a really good o- offensive line. And just the whole defensive line and, you know, and then you include Clowney and um, Van Noy, they shut down the run like they could not run the ball at all, the inside or outside. And, you know, Roquan and Patrick Green were flying all over the place. And it was it, it was really very encouraging to see and very exciting to see that kind of dominance from from your front. It did a very good job of getting after Jedrick Wills in this game, who's a left tackle, and he's he's not particularly good. I would also say Dewan Jones didn't look that good to me. I know he came out at the end of the game. I didn't see who replaced him, but uh, but he was oh, it was, it was Hudson, right? The guy who who projected to a guard when he's drafted a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, Dewan Jones looks like honestly, he just looks just like Falele to me, which means he's really not ready to be on the field. Um, is is. Mm-hmm. It, Six eight three seventy four. So right there, you've got a lot of similarities in terms of, of size and, and heft. And he's got very slow feet and has a lot of trouble um, managing his balance easily at that size. Gets beat outside very regularly. Um, but also, you know, for a 374-pound guy, I saw him getting bowled a fair amount. Yeah, that that's very discouraging <clears throat> to have that kind of bulk and some and somebody just be able to push you push you around like that. That's yeah. So, pride so that, becomes a yeah. Pride becomes an issue there, but he's I mean he's got a very high pad level, so whoever he's going against is going to have some pretty significant leverage against him, right? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and then you got to be careful of that. So that's why, you know, six eight is is you know thought to be great. And if it translates to arm length, then I think you, you can derive value from it. If it doesn't translate to arm length, I'm not all that excited about it. Um if you're six eight with 33 inch arms, I don't think that's a good thing at all, for example. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I want to talk about the overall Ravens simplified approach here, and I'm going to go through three elements here. They they played a nickel with a four man front on all but two of the offensive snaps. So they only went to the base defense twice. They didn't go to anything else the entire game. So normally I have this packages section that's in my article, and it has you know typically five packages maybe per game, where they maybe played a couple snaps of dime, and they they had a couple different types of nickels. No differentiation of any sort. It was all it was all nickel and with with two base plans. And the two base plans were the DPI for thirty seven yards, which doesn't even actually count as a snap as I count them up. But it's but it was a play that occurred on the field. And then the second one was the run for minus twenty. So mm-hmm. uh, it, it, the rest of the plays that nickel success was off of the freaking charts. And I, I want to just get to that briefly. Let me bring it up for nickel here in this game. Um, so with five defensive backs, they had 63 plays. And so there's one also, uh, kneel down at the end of the half that's excluded from that. So it's 63 plays, 188 yards. That's 2.98 yards per play with four sacks and three turnovers. Fantastic. You got no reason to leave that defense. If, if the offense can't prove they can somehow beat it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, I think when when they realized that DTR was starting, um, they they just decided, hey, if this fourth round pick, fourth fourth or fifth round pick can can beat us passing the ball, that's that's how we're going to beat, and we're just going to beat you up, you know, running the ball. We're going to our defensive line is just going to beat you up, and if 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 DTR can make enough plays to when when this game go, go ahead and do it and we're going to bet that he he's not going to make those plays up yeah I, I first of all i agree with you i think that they basically started the game with that but they're free to adapt as dtr proves he can beat them 
but he never did. I mean, he never was completing never. a big plays on the field. So it didn't leave, it didn't take away the option. He didn't bet the whole game at the start, is my point, mm-hmm. that they were going to do this. It's just, you know, he was put in the wonderful position, McDonald, I'm talking about, that he never had to make changes to a basic scheme that was working play after play after play. Right. At DTR, he, he looked like he was not ready to start the game. Um, I mean, I think there's, it's certainly possible, you know, he, he got reps in practice apparently, but he, it, it sounded like this decision was made a couple of hours before game time. And it's like, right. Hey kid, you got the ball. And he was just not ready to, to play. He, he either mentally and physically, he, he just wasn't ready to, to be out there. Yeah, reportedly, since J- uh, Watson has been limited all week, DTR was taking a lot of the first team reps at practice. So mm-hmm. you'd hope he'd be ready. But honestly, you know, there's ready fifth year career backup ready, and there's ready rookie getting his first NFL playing time after a week of practice. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It, it's kind of fun. It's interesting. Like they're saying um, it was Deshaun Watson's decision not to play in that game. Like, a couple of the players said they were he they were expecting everybody was expecting him to play and then at the last minute he he made the decision that he was not going to play and DTR gets the start so yeah. all, all I can say about that guy is he really deserved to have the camera on him all game and I know they wanted to do it because they want to show the re, the interaction between him and Robinson Thompson Robinson I'm just going to call him DTR the rest of the show because it's it's too hard to remember that he's Thompson Robinson or he might be Thompson. I'm not sure. Um, but but they wanted to show the inter- interaction between those two. And, uh, you know, they got a little bit of that when Watson would go over and he'd talk to him. But then, you know, you get into later in the game and it's mostly face palming from, from uh, uh, Watson after some of the interceptions. There's some clear, you know, this isn't working kind of stuff. I, I will say this regarding the decision to play at all. He has taken a lot of heat on the Cleveland boards for not playing this game. So their, their logic and it's fan logic. So let's not go too deep into this was that it seems to be a pain management issue. Number one, number two, it doesn't affect any contract that's coming in the future for Deshaun Watson. I mean, unless you think there's some injury that can be made significantly um, worse because it's some sort of fluid buildup in the shoulder. So, Mm-hmm. There, there might have been pain involved, but probably not a worse injury risk. And that they really thought he should have gut checked it out and played despite the pain and and try and make it work. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. And I I I can't blame him for you know being being upset because he's he's not playing for a contract. He's he's fully guaranteed for the next yep. three years after this one. So. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's even if if you're thinking about like what other bizarre groups might actually be interested in, in making sure that he plays, I put the NFLPA at the top of that group, because if you're going to have fully guaranteed contracts, those players better freaking play. And if the NFLPA isn't telling him, hey, look, this is this is you've already got, th- you know, two and a half strikes against you for the contract you signed, given you missed a half season of that and. Uh, you know, there's still all the legal mess around around what occurred. And he may have cleaned all that up, by the way, but but there's still all the bad aftertaste of it at the very least. Then you had a really bad year last, last year. Then you had a really bad first two games of this year. You finally got to go in in week three, and you're going to sit out week four in what potentially is the biggest home game of the entire season against the biggest divisional rival because you've got some fluid buildup. That is not setting a good precedent for the next guy, whether that's C.J. Stroud or somebody else who comes along earlier, who's going to want a big, uh, fully guaranteed five or six year deal. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, it was terrible to give him that contract, to give him that contract and it, it's bearing itself out. Yeah. yeah. All right. We talked about a little bit about the four man rush, but I want to talk about this a little more because this was the most extreme pass rush game I've seen from McDonald in his time here. So they had 40 plays that resulted in a pass or sack. There were some other scrambles in there too. I don't include them in that total, but there were 40 total that resulted in a pass or six. 36 of those times, the Ravens used a four-man pass rush. That's a 10% blitz rate there. They had two fives and two sixes to go with that, which is dramatically lower than the Ravens total, which is typically in the 30s in terms of the the, the blitz rate they use. Um, The four-man pass rush. Now, 
I know your expectations would be you could occasionally get pressure with four men, but uh, but it's much harder to have a consistent four man rush, and that's why teams that can do it effectively are so damn good. But on the 36 plays, the Browns gained 84 offensive yards on those 36 pass plays, 2.3 yards per play with three sacks and two turnovers. So first of all, three sacks out of 36 is an 8.3% sack rate with four men. That's astoundingly high. You'll take that every week if you can get it. (laughs) Oh, of course. Yeah. You'd probably take it overall from all your pass rushes, including fives and sixes, unless you're one of the greatest sack teams out there. Um, The, Two, la, 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 2006 Ravens um, did generate a four-man pass rush sack rate of almost 10% for the whole season, which thinking back on that, it still boggles my mind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they had a lot of great pass rushers, but they were very blitz-heavy too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so... You know, this, this is another thing. If if you're if you can sit back and rush the quarterback with four and have some good success, and I didn't even tell you the pressure uh, rate, but the pressure rate was forty five percent on those thirty six plays. They got they got uh, sixteen of their pressures. Oh, that's that doesn't work out exactly right. And it was forty five percent overall. It was eighteen out of forty, and might have been sixteen out of thirty six on the four man rushes. So uh, that pressure rate is astounding given the fact that it was basically all four-man pass rush. And, uh, you know, why would you ever change if if you could do that? And obviously the Ravens are having lots of success um, with having seven in coverage. Right, exactly, exactly, yep. All right, the last thing I want to talk about was the zone defense they played against Robinson. And, and mobile quarterbacks, it's well known because we have Lamar Jackson, of course, that that – um, you want to play zone defense against mobile quarterbacks because they, uh, when they leave the pocket, you want to be right on it. You want to have potentially spies, but you really want everybody on the field to know when the quarterback's leaving the pocket if you can, which means you give up some easier throws to make that happen. So you should give up some throws usually in front of you. Um, you typically won't give up as many deep throws because it's harder to beat a, you know, a cover three zone or even a cover two because you've got safety help coming over. Um, uh, with a split field, the safety can get to any throw to his side of the field. That's right, right? I'm not right. making a mess yeah. of that, right, Brady? Yeah. Mm-hmm. A single high, you can't really get to the sideline is the is the big difference. Um, but there's another advantage here in playing against a rookie quarterback is that I think they make a lot of mistakes with their eyes. They either stare down a receiver or they go through their reads in such a way that a savvy inside linebacker in this case, Roquan Smith, but Patrick Queen also played well in terms of coverage, would, would be someone who could who can figure out where the ball is going from the way the eyes are going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you could really see it. I mean, Roquan had two near miss uh, and it, interceptions, and there were a couple other plays where he he saw the receiver that was coming across and absolutely decked them and leveled them mm-hmm. and and it was even on on the um, interception by C- Stevens um, after Millett, um tipped the ball in the air. Roquan was coming like a missile. He got some of the receiver and most of Millett on that play. But I mean, <laughs> if if even if that ball was, you know, even remotely thrown accurately, like Roquan would have, yeah, just obliterated the receiver. So yeah, it, he he was all over the place. Yeah, yeah, it's it is. Stroud's accuracy, if you want to come up with a gun analogy here, and I'm not a big gun guy, but uh, Jackson in this game was a sniper rifle and Stroud was a sawed-off shotgun in terms of where that ball was going. <laughs> so mm-hmm. so yeah, it was a yeah. very broad accuracy issues he had to do. And um, you know, the other group, the, obviously the, the the inside linebackers did well, but the safeties did well too. They played very patient back-end defense. Uh, on the interception from by Stone, he was what? seven, eight, nine yards behind the receiver on the play. I mean, and he needed most of that. <laughs> they were playing in Cleveland and DTR threw that thing to, and to Cincinnati. And, there you go. and Stone was just there. The easiest, one of the easiest picks you'll ever have right there. It was, yeah, that was a, that was a, it was a room pass. service thing. I thought the Hamilton pick was a pretty easy one too. The Stevens yeah. one was a great reaction to the ball and a great tip by Mollette. 
Mm-hmm. But it's not – those weren't the only interception opportunities the Ravens had in this game. Queen, I don't think he deflected the pass, but he was going hard into Joku, and it looked like Njoku made a career decision to – business decision to hold up on the mm-hmm. play, and he might have tipped it himself, but he didn't go all off for that ball with Queen coming right at him. And the ball went back to Stone, who had to reach out to get it. It was just a little too far and glanced off his hand rather than being collected. They had two balls batted up, up at the line of scrimmage, one by Urban, one by Van Noy. Those are always high probabilities. And and when I say they're lottery tickets, but you know, they might be a 20% probability of interception when those things happen. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, just a, a you know, definitely a good set of interception opportunities in this game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you was, mentioned I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I was just saying, like that's why you want to play a lot of zone is you, you get seven eyes on uh, well, I'm sorry, 14 eyes with seven seven guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 14 eyes and, and seven players, you know, all looking at the quarterback, seeing, you know, and when he was as inaccurate as he is, those are just great opportunities for tip drills and you know, easy interceptions, and he, he gave them a lot of them. Yeah, that's you know that is really the, the the point here. It's eyes on the quarterback and how often you can do that by, by playing these zone defenses. And the other statistics where it's really showing up, the Ravens don't have a lot of interceptions. They only have four on the, on the season. There's several teams who have more, but they're second in the NFL now in PDs with 25. And they've played you know Joe Burrow who had the ball out quickly a lot and wasn't giving them a lot of PD opportunities. They played Gardner Minshew. Some of the same here. This was a big game for PDs. I think they might have had 10 in this game of their 25 on the season. And they probably had a few against Stroud as well. And I'm, I'm not you know, saying they didn't have anything because they had the 15 somehow split among the other three games. What has not been exceptional so far, and, and it's not terrible, but it's just not great, is they've only had one interception per 6.25 PDs. So f- four out of 25. Um, normally, you'd like that number to be about one every five. And I think I looked at the league as a whole and it was slightly under one every six so far this year. So it may have been, they've become a little less likely um, than they had been before. But the number of times they're getting their hands on the football is extremely exciting. And boy, would Ravens fans have ever guessed it at the start of this year based on what their secondary looked like. Right, exactly. Um, When Marlon Humphrey went down, I I think everybody was, we need to trade for somebody, you need to get somebody and, I mean, Rakusen has come back and has played well. Um, Darby has played very well. And Brandon Stevens has absolutely just broken out this year. I mean, he's 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 gone from, you know, a, maybe a quality backup to, you know, an above average starting cornerback. And, you know, when, and when Marlon gets back, they're going to have, you know, the good problems of figuring out how they're going to, rotate all of these guys in and keep them all fresh and keep them, you know, keep them just uh, playing as well as they have been. Let's stick with this point now since we're here. Um, But that is, I think one of the big questions for the Ravens coming down the stretch here is how do you reassimilate Humphrey back into a group where you might believe you have your nickel now, whether you believe that's Mallette or Hamilton. And we got we to talk about that one. Let's, let's leave that problem for separate because the, the slot corner and what they do with the safeties is kind of all intertwined. But let's just talk about the outside corners. If they have Humphrey, they've given Stevens all the snaps. I would assume this means he stays on the field you know, as we, as we move forward. But they may start rotating him. Yasin can't even get on the field for any reasonable number of snaps. I mean, he's, he's been healthy, and he only played um, it's a limited number of snaps in this last game. And I'm using the, the, the game book number for this one, but Yasin only played 25 snaps while Darby played 44. And that's been pretty similar in terms of the ratio between the two through these uh, in the weeks since Yasin has come back. Mm -hmm. So what on earth do you do with these guys to Aaron Rodgers season is officially over, but yours has just begun at my bookie NFL college ball and the brand new cash out system gives you options to bet and win all season long. First two legs of your parlay hit, cash out early and place another bet or let it ride for a chance at a bigger payday. Join us at MyBookie for an entire season filled with daily odd boosts, same game parlays, and huge prize pool contests. 
Right now, my bookie has a no strings attached cash bonus that lets you deposit and withdraw quick. Use the promo code RAVENS on your first deposit of $50 or more, and you can receive up to $200 in cash instantly credited to your MyBookie account. That's promo code RAVENS to claim your cash bonus now. You can bet anything, anytime, anywhere, only with MyBookie. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you with fast, chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. If you're too busy this fall to cook but want to make sure you're eating well, then get Factor. This, guys, this is what I did. We were moving, packed up, packed up all my dishes, everything needed better meals. I signed up for Factor, it's best meals, probably the healthiest I've eaten in a month thanks to these Factor meals. Because with Factor, you can skip those extra trips to the grocery store and the chopping, the prepping, the cleanup, all while still getting flavor and the nutritional quality you need. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat, enjoy, and then get back to crushing your goals, which for me was trying to move. But now I can't. I need them for work at lunch every day. They're perfect. So this September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes. No prep, no mess. So head to factormeals.com slash ravens50 and use that code ravens50 like I did to get 50% off. That's ravens50 at factormeals.com slash ravens50 to get 50% off your factor meals. You get the playing time. In. And I hope your answer is not, well, we'll have some more injuries and we'll figure it out. Because we know that's probably the reality of the situation. But what do you do if they're all four healthy? Well, that's certainly a possibility. But, I mean, I think um, obviously Marlon's got to be in there and he's got to be in there virtually, you know, 100% of the snaps, depending on how healthy his foot is. Um, I mean, the way they're playing, you can kind of slowly move Marlon in more and more and ramp him up a little bit if – if you know his foot isn't 100 percent healthy to get him 100 percent healthy and i think brandon stevens is the way he's played um these four games he's really earned that other starting cornerback position and you now you, you not only want him to get more reps for this season you also want him to get more reps for 24 and 25 because yeah you, darby and um yes and may or may not be here next year but Stevens definitely will. So you, you, you definitely want to get as long a look from them as you can. Yeah. You know, great point. And they've all the, obviously they lost their fifth round draft pick because they just couldn't find a space for them, even on this mediocre group of corners that they had. And now they've lost uh, JAD to some sort of hamstring injury. I don't think there's any question he's going to IR, even if he might be back in three weeks, just because the roster spot has more value than what he would offer the team on special teams during that time. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, JAD's, at the bottom of the roster depth depth right now. And yeah, he, they, they'll need somebody to fill his shoes in, for special teams. By the way, I apologize folks out there, but you can probably hear I'm sicker than a dog right now. We're just trying to make it through this episode, but really enjoying this conversation with Brandon Croxton and, and uh, always, well, always love uh, talking football with him. Um, I, I, I want to get back to the zone defense component of this because it's been so effective through four weeks. The Ravens are only allowing 3.75 yards per play right now, and they lead the NFL in that statistic. Per pass play, they are very similar to that because it's just about equal run and pass. I'll, I, I, let's see, I'll take a look, quick look for it because I've got that right here. Oh, I'll bring up the right spreadsheet here. So... Yeah, they're giving up 3.8 rush yards per carry and actually only 3.7 pass yards per play. So just absurdly good numbers. Let's put this this in context. I believe the 2000 Ravens gave up only 4.3 yards per play. Uh, The 1999 Ravens, I believe, were the best ever, and they gave up 4.1, if I recall correctly. So this is a this is an unbelievable start to the season. And they lead, they, you know, they lead the NFL in that particular category in terms of yards per play. So 
the the question I would have is, is there any impetus or should the bias strongly be for the Ravens to continue with a cover two zone pretty much regardless of quarterback for as long as it continues to work? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. There you go. Right. <laughs> That's what I'll say. I mean, you know, they they have really been playing excellent team defense. Um, they are very disciplined. They're not missing assignments. Um, I mean, if you think back even to last year, like the Miami game, one of the Tyreek Hill touchdowns, somebody blew an assignment and you know, Tyreek went uncovered for a 50 yard touchdown and, you know, they had plays like that against new England also. And Mm -hmm. they're not having, they're not having these breakdowns. They're not having mix ups and coverages. They are playing excellent discipline team defense. And it's, it's really very impressive to, to, to watch right now. I mean, I mean, they're not, they're not giving up big plays and they're, and the longest play that they've given up has literally been that defensive pin, uh, PI um, again oh, for 37 Steelers, yards. Yeah, for 37 yards. Uh, the next lo- if, if you take out that 40 yard run they had in garbage time when they had some of their backups in, the next longest play they've had all season was 34 yards. And hmm. I mean, in in this modern day NFL where you can pass the ball all over the place, the defense can't touch you and everything that's, you know, skewed to the offense to not even give up a 40 yard play through four games is, is very impressive. That, that is very impressive. And, and more than that, you know, yak opportunities happen. So even if you're playing pretty good defense, you know, running back gets free on a screen pass and, or, you know, Zay flowers or, or his cousin gets free in the, in, in level two, you can easily give up a 40 yard play, even when it's not a coverage breakdown. Uh, mm-hmm. Per se, you might miss a tackle to do it, but you, you, even when it's not a coverage breakdown, you can do it. So uh, that's extremely impressive to me in terms yeah. of of uh, of what they did. It's a good stat to have right right now through this this point. Let me get back to this a little bit more because here's where I was was kind of winding up to in terms of the question very slowly: is do the Ravens need to consider keeping Hamilton at nickel because of the impact of cover two? So they had Daryl Worley playing on the back end. Daryl Worley for a game and a, what about 10 more snaps in this one played some fantastic safety on the back end, made every play he was supposed to make tackles were all made, had a PD, I believe in this one by the sideline. Um, and mm-hmm. he, he was completely fulfilling the Hamilton back end responsibility um, for his time there. And nobody would throw at it in particularly Minshew in that third game. Um, was not throwing into uh, you know the, the area even between level two and three because of the the, the risk that would come with that. Um, I don't think my point is I, I'm not sure you need to have Hamilton back there, and I damn well know that Hamilton up near the line of scrimmage is an absolute terror in terms of pressure and other things he can provide you in terms of run support and whatnot to very significantly support trying to defend the run against a six man box and add to your pass rush as well as zone coverage responsibilities. Yeah, I mean, I think the way the way Hamilton is playing, he he's really found his spot where he can be a threat and and a really a terror on the offense at that slot corner position. And you have a lot of really nice coverage safeties back there. Mm-hmm. I mean, and and it's a really good depth. Like you have Geno Stone, Marcus Williams going to be coming back in you know hopefully a week or two, and then um and then yeah, hopefully Worley's not hurt too much and then they have um the guy on the practice squad yes. uh harman harman yeah. harman harman who's who's also a, a more traditional free safety can play can play back in that cover too and yeah it, when you have that much in depth just yeah let let kyle can he can play the deep safety but let him wreak havoc inside mm-hmm. and close to the line of scrimmage like he has been yeah, I mean, I'm for it. And then the the one, you know, shadow on that, that that came up just this last week is Arthur Mollette, all of a sudden out of nowhere, is playing great slot corner. What do you do with him? Do you sit him after he did all that? Or do you, you know, let him play slot corner on some sort of basis, meaning 
against certain receivers. So if it's 12, it's Hamilton up and, and playing that tight end, which is probably going to be a base defense anyway, the way the Ravens like to play it. They'd probably be just – it wouldn't be a play where Mollett would be on anyway. Or, or do you do you stick with Hamilton up there regardless of who the receiver is? Because a lot of teams have big slots, and if you want to run a small slot up against Hamilton, you you have the risk that Hamilton's going to going to catch him off the line of scrimmage with those long arms and disrupt the route. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's a good problem to have. You can mix and match, and you know you can you can always put Hamilton back at deep safety and put in um, Mollett if that's the better matchup that you feel that you have and you know, go back the other way. And it, yeah, like, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for for that right there right now. You know, it's interesting. Mollett was a guy who early in camp had made a bunch of plays and it looked like, okay, maybe this is a guy who can help the Ravens at slot corner. Um, not, not playing out there with the starters, but they went through that whole rotation of trying to have Brandon Stevens play slot and then, you know, bringing Pepe in, then he got hurt. And then they, then they went to, Ardarius Washington and looked like that was really the answer. And uh, before Ardarius Washington went to Mallette actually, and he'd made some plays. And then Mallette got hurt for like three weeks of camp, or it seemed like that long anyway. I don't believe he saw any action in the preseason, so he missed all the games. So it might have even been longer than that. And then you really wonder. He made the roster. It was a little bit surprising because he made the roster over Kelly effectively, and they, they're cutting loose a fifth round draft pick to keep a guy who they only own for one year. They only have him under contract for this one year. Mm-hmm. And you, you wonder how good must this guy be that they really believe in him that more, or maybe how bad is Kelly that he's just not picking things up that 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 becomes a problem. Um, and they, you know, they, they did what apparently was reasonable. They had Molette with some guaranteed money, and Molette is a uh, uh, is a slot corner for sure. He's not an outside guy, um, and. I, I'm just I'm so shocked with how well he played in this game relative to where I would have projected him to be in terms of game readiness based on all the time he's missed. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, he's um he's he they just keep uh installing different players and they're playing roles very well and they're like I was saying earlier they they're just playing great team defense and it's very disciplined and that, that you know, no matter what what kind of you know corners they, they have out there, they're throwing into very tiny windows right now. The way that they're playing, and it's not easy for any offense. Um, we got a couple more things to talk about here that I want to go into. One, they they lost the snap count, sixty five to fifty five. By the way, I, I saw some arguing on Twitter going on between people who said, "Well, with the Ravens winning the snap count and time of possession like they did, they may have." you know, been ahead in terms of time of position from the run. They sure as heck didn't win snap count in this game. That's that's an ongoing problem with how the offense has been largely inconsistent at piling up first downs in particular over the last two games. But the the um, Browns went just four of 16 on third down. Um, and the Ravens, while they were at 79% through two games in terms of series success rates, so that's the percentage chance that you get a first down or a touchdown after any first down, including the start of a possession. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, they have been in the high 60s, about 68% since those first two weeks. And it doesn't, maybe it doesn't seem like that would be all the difference in the world. That is all the difference in the world in terms of having a great series success rate and a, you know, in the 20s kind of series success rate for the National Football League. Mm-hmm. Do you um do you think maybe that's part of the strategy that they had with the Browns is like we're not gonna do anything we're not gonna take any risks that are going to um make a you know, cause have have the Browns make a bit a big play on defense that can potentially cause a turnover that can change the course of the of you know of of the game because I mean. The the Ravens, you know, part of the great defense that they're playing is they're not giving up long drives. Um, I mean, they they driving 40, 50 yards to even get in field goal range against them right now is a very difficult proposition. So let's not give them a short field. Let's, you know, 
be conservative third third and eight sometimes we'll just hand it off and punt and you know get them inside the inside the 20 and let our defense do the work because we're catering to you you know the unit that's playing the best right now Uh, first of all you're right on the money with all of that all of that is absolutely on the money and the better team should take less risk and the leading team should take less risk. And I kind of want to tie this into two good film study mailbag questions we got this week. And so let's, let's knock those off right now. Uh, okay. At Ola Dinakin underscore four asked, how do you think the DB rotation will be handled once William and Humphrey come back? Does Hamilton stay in the slot to keep Gino on the field? Do you think they keep Stevens as corner two or maybe rotate him with Darby and Rakia Sin? All all great questions, by the way. I think we just tried our best to answer that. I, I would foresee, by the way, that, that Humphrey will be in for a limited amount of snaps in his first game back. Mm-hmm. Seem reasonable? I would I would agree. I would agree with that. Yeah. And then they'll figure it out. And I hope it just doesn't get figured out for them with injuries. I, I don't believe that Humphrey is going to stay at slot corner this year. I know it's been something that's been done with him before. He's a very physical player who could who could give you a who could be a good slot corner, but I think you lose something in terms of his value if you don't keep him on the outside. Do you have a strong feeling yeah. about that? No, no. I think the way Hamilton is playing at slot, there's no reason to move Marlon inside. Like in the past, when they've moved Marlon inside, it's kind of been more out of necessity. And with the, the way ha- Hamilton's playing inside, I think – you, you keep Marlon on the outside and Hamilton on the inside. And I think that's your best um, combination of slot and outside corner. And then you, you factor in, you know, whether it's stone and, or um, Worley or, and Marcus Williams, when he gets back, that I think that's, that's where you want to keep your safety slot corner outside. Okay. So I would have been the, of the opinion and I was at the beginning of this year, that you shouldn't let the decision about Stone being a better player than whoever your slot corner is determine where you played Kyle Hamilton. Because Kyle Hamilton's a whole different order of magnitude in terms of his potential for superstardom. So playing him at the right position is more important than anything you can do with the cart to drag the horse differently. Agree. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I, I'm now, I'm not so sure I believe that anymore. Gino has played so well you know, he's got two picks. He looks like an incredible patient center fielder back there. The Ravens seem to be very committed to this cover two. Gino is the perfect split field safety and cover two. great instincts, moves the ball. Well, loose bracket player, always looking for the overthrow. There's so much I like about him on the back end that I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if I can get that from Mollett on the front end. So while I think Marcus Williams gives you even more of that on the back end at the other half of the field, I want to keep all three of them on the field. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Same place. I, 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 yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if we have four safeties now for, well, uh, sorry, three safeties plus Mallet for three spots, including slot corner plus two safety spots. And we got four outside corners for two spots. Very, very nice problem to have. And I don't think anybody would have predicted this based on where we were. Right, exactly. Let's get back to your risk question because I thought that was really good. I know I had a good question here. I'm trying to find it here as I'm kind of stumbling over myself. Let me see if I've got it. Um, No, that is not what I want. Oh, darn it. I, I want to make sure I get this right. So the question basically was this is to, should we be concerned about the fact that the Ravens scored 2.3 points per drive in this game against the Browns? Now, 2.3 in past years has been not not that great a number. You know, it'd still be okay. It'd be at least the middle of the league. But, but this year it would be sixth in the entire league. And scoring in 2022 and 23 is significantly depressed. So I promise you we're going to get back to your risk component of this okay. about not taking risks. So... I, I, the question is, are there reasons to be concerned about the Ravens only scoring 2.3? Because they certainly were not completely efficient on offense. They were just incredibly efficient in the red zone, as we'll get to. Um, should we be concerned at all about the 2.3 points per drive in this game against the Browns? Um, 
to to I think to a degree, like the Ravens are not playing excellent offensive football for the entire year. I, I would say, and including this game, um, they 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 have looked good at times, and they have you know looked like they're a team that's out of sync at other times. Like, I mean, you go back to the Colts game. That was a game where they really looked out of sync. Um, I mean, the Browns won. They, their strongest unit is their defense, and that's one of the top defenses in the league. I mean, I've, and going into that, going into the game, that, that was the best defense in the league. I, I think it, it just really came down to let's – play discipline, let's not turn the ball over, let's not do anything that's going to give the Browns a short field because we don't believe um, DTR is going to move the ball on our defense three times down the field to get touchdowns in order to beat us. So we'll, we'll take our opportunities when we'll see them, when we have them. Lamar makes, you know, those two or three incredible Lamar plays and that's how we're going to win this game and just play the field position battle. And I mean, I, I think that's, that, that's a game Lamar played. I mean, they were pretty inefficient, but Lamar made the, a couple of, you know, just those Lamar special plays that makes him so special. It changed, changed the team, changed the game. I, I, you know, I certainly like the notion of putting it in, Lamar's hand. The, the, the guy who came up with the question was Mark Liu. He's at FOTW85. And he said, you know, are, 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 should we be concerned about this? I, I think his, the, a good point that he makes is that the red zone success the Ravens have had is unsustainable. I'll get to the exact numbers here in a minute here. But that the Ravens need to move the ball more effectively. And the Ravens' series success rate certainly has been low these last couple of weeks. And in week three... There wasn't any incentive for that to be low. They were just bad um, in playing the Colts in terms of, of moving the ball efficiently to get only a two-thirds series success rate. It was 20 of 30 last week. This week, it was just a little bit better than that. It was right around 69%. And it, it was, I think there were contributing factors that were not um, uh, related to the offense just being lousy or even the Browns defense being good. I think that the, the, the primary factor was what you said in terms of risk that – the Ravens for the entire second half, more or less, were making decisions that added win probability at the expense of expected points. So most people look at expected mm -hmm. points models and they say, oh, these are the be all end all. But the truth of the matter is the second half of NFL games are largely played for expected win probability and not expected points. And so yeah. I don't think it's a very good measure at all for that reason. Right. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, it comes to strategy and head coaches are trying to win games. They're not trying to pad stats. They're not trying, and sometimes sacrificing yards, sacrificing, you know, going for it on fourth down or, you know, running the ball on a third down rather than passing, things like that. Or you, you're, you're trying to run clock, you're trying to kill clock. And, <laughs> you're trying to get to the end of the game and win the game as opposed to putting up more points. I mean, once, once the Ravens got to that, that Mark Andrews touchdown at right at the end of the half, I mean, that it was over after that. Like yeah. the, the Browns could play, could have played eight quarters and they were not going to get 20 to 20 points. And it, it was over. So in the second half, it's just don't do anything stupid. Don't turn the ball over. Just, Run, just grind this clock out. And if if you have to punt, so be it. Yeah, I want to see what the series success rate was differed by the first and second half because they also brought in Huntley, who contributed a three and out. I mean, I'm not blaming too much on Tyler in this game, obviously, but in the first half, they had eight first downs and went three of seven on third down. So it looks like they were eight of twelve. Not really any difference between the first and second half in terms of doing things. They, what they benefited from is having a 10 yard field where they made one play and put it in the end zone. That's great. And having, um, you know, two other drives where they got into the red zone and, and were able to, were able to put it in. I guess one of those was a long, no, no, that was a 10 yard drive was a long interception return. So 
Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, I, I, I think we've answered that question probably as well as we can on one show. It, it might deserve a show of its own uh, out there. So great question, Mark. We really appreciate it. And, and uh, if you'd like to come on the show and discuss it more, I'd be happy to, to do that with you. Um, I was going to talk about packages, but I think we hit it all earlier. Um, the 3.8 yards per play in four games. Yeah, okay. How about the seasonal totals? In four games, they played 247 nickel snaps. And that's out of 273. No, check that. 276 total snaps. But 26 snaps of base, so that's less than 10%. Three snaps of dime, that's 1%. I'm, I'm literally going into conniptions as I hear that, but I understand this is a committed nickel team with Patrick Queen on the team on the field at this point with, uh, with Roquan for all downs. And, you know, 247 nickel snaps. This team does not have a lot of variation in what they've done through four weeks, and yet they've been remarkably successful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, they're, they're, they're just playing great team defense. It's, they're, and they're being very disciplined. They've, they've really mastered this, this nickel defense and the zone defense. It's, you know, it's very encouraging to see. All right, let's let's uh, let's move on and talk quickly about the, the pass rush and leave all our other discussions, maybe a couple more mailbag questions for the couple for the second uh, segment of this. But, uh, you know, four-man pass rush was 36 out of 40. Um, let's divide it up into ample time and space, BOQ and pressure, which are the three groups that I define. So those, those 40, 15 ample time and space opportunities is a lot. It's about 38%. You would expect a quarterback to have more of those when you're, you know, running a committed four-man pass rush because you're just not going to get home every time with somebody and within three seconds. And he had 15 times where um, he had that kind of pocket. Now here's the good news. 15 of those opportunities, even though he wasn't sacked or anything like that, didn't have any negative plays. And in fact, didn't have any turnovers. You could have a turnover there. He threw for only 94 yards or 6.3 yards per play. That is not very good with ample time and space. In fact, that's quite bad. Normally I'd want somebody to be in the between eight and maybe 10, 10 and a half yards per play with ATS. Mm-hmm. All right, move on. The ball was out quickly seven times, total of 13 yards on those plays. So 1.9 um, yards per play. That's absolutely terrible and included an interception. In fact, it's beyond terrible. Um, the, the, the one team that seemed to have modest success with that was the Bengals who were right around five yards per play against the Ravens and those be a, a ball out quick opportunity. So relatively few of those Thompson, despite a high incentive to do so, didn't get rid of the ball quickly too much in this game. Mm-hmm. And then of 40 passes, they had 18 pressures. And this is one of the most astounding numbers I've ever seen. Total yardage. I want to make sure I get this right here. Total yardage on the 18 pressures. No, no, no. Take me to it. I'll get there just one second. Was minus... 34 net yards. So there were some sacks in there and that's, I have, I have this wrong in my article. I'll, I'll make sure I go correct this, but it's, it's one negative 1. 1.9 yards per play. There've been some bad numbers in the past. And I know at Tennessee, when they sacked uh, what's his face, Mariota 11 times, they, they might've had a number like that, but that's just an incredible number for one football game. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty bad. All, 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 all around. For DTR, it, it it kind of like he just didn't look like he was ready to play a football game. And I'm I'm gonna go back a, about 20 years on this, but he just reminded me, Spur John Wynn, who had actually played with the Browns, who was just in an all time just terrible performance um, against the Ravens 20 years ago, and it just it, it was just not ready to play. And same with. Uh, same with uh, same same with DTR. He he just wasn't ready to play, and the Ravens just absolutely killed him. You're on mute, Ken. It wouldn't be a film study a podcast without that. <laughs> so uh, Spurgeon Wynn, I believe, played in the uh, playoffs against the Ravens with Denver. I may be thinking about the wrong guy. In 2000, is that the one, or do you no, uh, the 35 no. to nothing loss to the Browns? No, no. This, this was this was this was another 
but he I, I don't think he played with any other team after the Browns. But this was 2000 or 2001 when he played with the Browns, and it was just an all-time bad performance. Okay, I am too fascinated by this. Okay, spelled it wrong. <laughs> Let's look at those game logs for his career. So I know he, he was, yeah, in 2000, he played some for Denver, played in the playoffs when the Ravens injured a couple other quarterbacks. Oh, and wow. Brian Greasy was out, and then he came in. Um, but with the Browns in 2001, maybe? Maybe yeah, that they, was it, yeah. Yeah, that could be it. He, he had a terrible game. Um, his passer rating was 23.2 in that game. So that could, that could well be it. <laughs> but yeah. uh, all right, very cool. So that's a good that's a good analogy. Um, the Ravens, by the way, in terms of pass rush, they rushed four. You know, most of the times we said thirty six out of forty, but they also didn't blitz much. Six individual plays, they had some form of a blitz. Most of that was a zone blitz where they're trying to bring one guy from off ball and drop somebody from the other side to overload a side. So they did some of that to try and mess it up, but but only six times. That's 0.15 off-ball blitzes per play, which is very, very low. Um, they had six, sorry, seven plays with a stunt, six singles and one pair. That did include four pressures. They're pretty effective. I expect some of those were called on the field by the defenders. So it's not something that had to be called for the sidelines. They probably were having a little bit of fun, frankly, in that second half, getting after the quarterback in some different ways. Uh, one, uh, and there was another question, I'll try and get the name right. Um, about he, who noticed that the Ravens used Clowney inside on several plays while having either Matabike or even um, uh, Travis Jones on the outside, on the outside shoulder of the tackle on some plays. Uh, okay. you, you know, having played defensive line, what do you think they're trying to accomplish with that kind of a formation? Um. You, you you want to match up Clowney's quickness on a slower guard, um, and you're more or less trying to get a quick inside pass rush to rattle a quarterback getting getting his in his uh, throwing zone quicker and with a quicker guard with a quicker um, defensive end, and you're kind of sacrificing. Uh, you're out your edge pass rush and you or you just hope that bigger guy can collapse the pocket around the um, around the tackle more. Does it does it and I didn't actually notice if this were the plays or not where they stunted, but it, does it set you up for a T.E. stunt or a T.E. twist of some sort? There generally not. <laughs> yeah, it, it it's generally not. Not really, but some some will, some won't. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fair I, enough. I, I, yeah, I don't remember. I, I, I'll have to go back and look. I don't remember Clowney lining up on at the defensive tackle position, but um, I, I do remember a couple of times where he was the he they they did a did some kind of stun and he came on the inside through that. So yeah, I'll have oh, to they go definitely back did that. Try yeah. to check. Yeah, I'll have to go back and check it. Check that out. I think it's it would have all been in the second half, and it would have been before between maybe two and four plays. I would say in total, because I think I noticed okay. it a minimum of two times. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, uh, zero simulated pressures is the other name of this. Of this now, that's a staple of the Ravens' defense is to drop mm -hmm. guys from the line of scrimmage in two or more to try and really confuse the opposing offensive line. You know. Solid offensive line in terms of what Cleveland showed. I think the, the Ravens out physical them in the middle, and they, they really had some good pass rush from the inside. You mentioned that earlier. But but uh, uh, I, I guess I would also say that I'm a little surprised that they didn't try and mess up DTR more by showing him simulated pressures, other than it obviously it does create a disadvantage potentially for your linebackers dropping back into coverage. Yeah, I, again, I think DTR showed exactly that he was not ready to play, and they were like, "Let's not do anything to give him any kind of confidence." It, it, if 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 he even shows anything that he can be, beat our base coverage, then maybe we'll throw some blitzes, throw you know, throw a little trickery in there to confuse him a little bit. But there was just there there was no need for, to do any of that. 
just play just play base. Don't give up a get a big play and dare him to beat us, which he was just not able to do. Yeah. All right, Brandon, just a tremendous amount of fun having this discussion with you. Really appreciate you coming on the show and doing the defense where you clearly have a you know personal stake and a background in. Tell folks where they can talk football with you online. Sure. I'm on uh, Twitter uh, at Brandon Croxton five and um, a big fan and love, love talking Ravens. All right. Outstanding. Uh, other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, I'm going to make a big push this off season to vet any analytic models on a regular basis. People want to hear. And I realize this, that's not everybody's cup of tea, but I'm talking about at least one per week where it's either nationally published things or if you have something that's local, more Raven centric, I'd love to hear from you on that. Anyway, DMs are always open on Twitter. Hit me up. It's content I really enjoy as someone who comes from that kind of background. And uh, I'll, I'll be sure to get back to you very quickly. Brandon, thanks again for coming on. All right, great. Thank you. And we'll talk to you in part two in just a few minutes.